My name is John Cunningham, and I'm the Executive Director of the National AIDS Memorial. Welcome. I would like to start off by asking all current, past board and staff to please raise your hands and be recognized. <clears throat> One of the greatest blessings I am given in this role is the opportunity to cross paths with so many people and to connect with them and to share stories, for Memorial is about stories. Every person here has their own story. And I recently had the opportunity to hear an inspiring story firsthand from our next guest, Sonia Friedman. Woo! Telling stories is what Sonia does for a living as an award-winning theater producer having won over 40 Tonys and over 50 Oliviers. She has often focused her talents to support issues and causes that move her. In fact, she just opened the new play Inheritance in New York City. If I could ask everybody to please give us just a couple more minutes and quiet down, thank you. As Pat Kristen said last year, I can outweigh you. <laughs> thank you. However, the story that Sonia shared with me is, was a personal story. How as a stage manager at the National Theater in the 1980s, she rallied London's theater community to support friends and colleagues who were sick and dying, producing major events raising funds and shining a spotlight on the crisis, much as many of us did here. In 1986, during some of the darkest days when the AIDS crisis was worsening day by day, she grew increasingly passionate about the ways in which she could help and make a difference. As so many of you in this room have done, Sonia immersed herself in service to others selflessly, enormous, being enormously successful fundraising and awareness events, raising millions of dollars, or pounds in her case, through highly successful events while at the same time changing hearts and minds. However, the story that Sonia shared with me, many of us also here share, and that's a story of survivor's guilt. Sonia exited those years of producing major events and was seen as a major theater producer. And as a result of that, she's gone on to high acclaim. But when we walked here in this space just a month ago, she shared that it's been very difficult because much of her success was, out of, was rooted in the days of the epidemic, helping to raise money. We all know that feeling. We're all survivors but we all persevere. So I asked Sonia if she would share that story with us here tonight. We are currently working on a project because she is producing Harry Potter, the Curse, Harry Potter the Cursed Child here in San Francisco. And we're working on a project where we can take the otherism and the differences of those children that are focused in that theater production, focus it on children today in our communities around the Bay Area bring them to the grove so they can share those stories and create the linkage to the otherism that was so prevalent in the early days of the epidemic. I am so pleased to introduce Sonia Friedman. Um, hi, sorry. Um, this is the first time I've ever publicly talked about what I did in the 80s because um, it didn't, never felt appropriate. Um, but coming here to the Grove with John last month, um, I felt uh, that somehow it was completing a circle in my life. Um, just give me a few minutes. I'm just going to talk, um, and I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I think I have to put my glasses on. Um, as John said, I'm a theatre producer. I've been a theatre producer now for 30 years. I've produced many plays all over the world. And yes, I've been quite successful at it. Um, I live in stories. Um, I'm always looking for stories. I get lost in stories. Um, and so then I'm going to start by quoting a play uh, which feels profoundly relevant, being here right now, here at the Grove. As John said, it's called The Inheritance. It's on Broadway right now. 
It follows the interlinking lives of three generations of gay men in search of belonging and understanding and asks how much we owe to those who lived, loved and died before us and questions the role we have for future generations. This is the quote. He thought of all the men who died in those years and what they might have become and what the world would have looked like today had they been allowed to end their story on their own terms. Eric wondered what his life would be like if he'd not been robbed by a generation of mentors, poets, friends, and perhaps even lovers. This play, being here in San Francisco today and opening Harry Potter tomorrow in your inspiring city, connecting with the present and the past and thinking about the future in such a profound way got me thinking about where I belong, where I fit into this chain. In the mid-1980s, I was a 20-year-old stage manager working at the National in London. I started noticing men in our industry getting sick, disappearing. I didn't really know what was happening. The, the, the press, the media, the government, they weren't addressing it. It was so hidden. I tried to find out. So, I was a penniless young girl. I was not directly, personally impacted by the AIDS crisis, but many in my industry were. Don't worry, I know a lot of pages, I'll do it quickly. Um, uh, um, but I knew I had to do something, anything. I couldn't stand by. It wasn't a choice. I did what I could. A friend and I, an actress called Kelly, we rallied. We went to the Terence Higgins Trust, the only AIDS charity at the time, to ask what we could do. They said, do what you know. So even though we weren't producers, we had no idea what we were doing. We put on shows. We phoned up actors, musicians. We begged rich people for offices, for fax machines, for telephones. Remember, this is before internet. We wrote letters. There was so much fear and misinformation, but we persisted and we created many, many big events in theatres, initially raising money, but most importantly, raising awareness. We did a marathon sing-along for 24 hours and Freddie Mercury closed the show. In fact, this time, oh yeah, around this time. Uh, we went into schools, I went into schools as a 20 year old myself, I talked to children, I talked to teachers, I talked to people who were frightened, who didn't understand it. I was the acceptable face. We paid electricity bills, we went round to men's house, we, we bought them food, we became buddies. Like many of us here, I found myself spending a lot of time at funerals. I met so many, many brave people in their final weeks and months of their lives. The fundraising we did produced some of, some of the biggest events in British history. Shop Assistance was one of them. It raised hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. It was on national news televisions. It played all day on the national radios. And it, and it, it worked because we got celebrities working in shops. Doesn't sound amazing. It was in Covent Garden, which is a big shopping district in, in London, and hundreds of celebrities turned up, and they drew, drew fans, they drew shoppers, they drew people who'd never, ever been confronted or had to talk about what AIDS was. Um, and uh, we managed to start to de-stigmatise what was going on. We even went into fashion. We designed underwear. We sold underwear with slogans, sleep easy, wear a nightcap, don't, <laughs> it worked. We sold out, you should do it again. Um, and don't be an incurable romantic. With a, with, a, with a man holding a bunch of what you thought were roses, but it was actually wilting condoms. It was really good, take it. Um, anyway. What's my point? My point is, as a young person, 
as young people, we did what we could. We got on with it. In 1988, as you all know, World AIDS Day was established on December the 1st. Again, we looked around us and looked to our own theatre community to see what we could do. We took over the theatres. We gathered a group of PWAs, as we called them then, a person with HIV AIDS, people living with AIDS. And at the curtain call, at every show across the country, a PWA walked on stage with dignity and grace and addressed the audience. Hello, I'm a person living with AIDS. In 1988, that was astonishing. We reached thousands and thousands of people on one night across the country. <laughs> These people, they talked to the audience. For the first time, they were given a voice. They were given an identity. There was so much confusion, so much information, but boy, did it work. It was confronting, it was very real, it was humane, emotional, and hugely impactful. So many people sitting in those theatres had never seen a person living with HIV, AIDS before, and it became a reality. And then the ushers and the cast shook buckets, and the audience left the theatre. Now, you think that's normal? Somebody had to start that. We did. We raised a lot of money. We had hundreds of volunteers helping us. I drove around London in my car, picking up the money from the stage doors, putting it in my back seat, going to another place, and then spent days and days with my friends counting the notes and the coins. Those, that money went straight into the pockets of the men who were dying. We went round to their homes to help them have some dignity in their final months. We did this for several years. Eventually, the PWA stopped making speeches. Too many of them had died. They weren't enough. But I'm proud to say, 31 years later, these bucket collections still take place every London theatre on and around World AIDS Day. I'm now nothing to do with it. The community took it over. But every time I sit in a theatre now and hear a World Day Day speech given by a member of the cast and see the company rattling their buckets, I quietly shed a tear. But I'm also deeply proud that I and a small group of friends were able to do our part, then make a difference. It's taken me 30 years to comprehend what happened and 30 years to deal with my survivor's guilt because in the early 90s, I then went on to become a theatre producer and I went in a different direction. So why am I here now? Why am I talking to you? Because producing The Inheritance has made me think about connections, about the part I played 31 years ago. I'm thinking about the chain of events that have led me here Back in the 1980s, I didn't know I was setting up any chains into the future. It's not our job to know the effect we will have on the world. It is our job just to do it. But now, producing the inheritance, I discovered there's a whole generation of young people who don't really understand the extremity of what happened in the 80s. I mean, how could they possibly know what it was? what it felt like. So that's why I'm here now, to help to make connections. I know all of you here understand, but I'm gonna be speaking as if some of you don't. So for all of you out there, whatever your cause, whatever the crisis, whatever the need, do your bit. Make the world a better, safer, kinder place. You won't understand your chain in the future yet, but if you do something, you will make a connection. 
I'll end with a quote from The Inheritance because the playwright Matthew Lopez sums it up much better than me. This comes from a character, Margaret, an eight-year-old mother who lost her son to HIV AIDS. 30 years ago, we turned a blind eye to the deaths of tens of thousands of our fellow countrymen. In our disgust, we looked away. We made ourselves deaf to the cries of so many of our fellow citizens, of so many of our sons. Why were there so many allowed to die this way? I think it's because these men's illness required that the Americans think about the means by which they contracted it. It required them to look at gay men and accept their nature, accept their affection and their sexual desire for one another as equal to our own. Most people couldn't do that. Well, I was there and I could. I tried to help and that's why I stand here proudly today amongst you all. We are all privileged because we can do what they could not. We can live. Thank you.